Thanks, Alexander, for that intro. I'm so honored to be here today and really excited about all the conversations that everyone's been having since yesterday. Um, I was born in Lebanon, and my family moved to the US when I was four. Uh, we moved to New York in the winter, and it was really cold. <laughs> um, we do go back to Beirut once a year to visit family, and a couple years ago on one of these trips, I became kind of obsessed with Lebanese vernacular type, and I began capturing the landscape in photos from the back seat of my grandpa's car. And if you've never been to Lebanon, let me tell you, uh, the driving conditions make it really difficult to get good pictures. This is real. So that brings me to the project that I want to share with you today, which is my undergraduate thesis en route, uh, which took the form of a book. I'll be focusing more on the content of the book and its implications rather than the design itself. The project, which consisted of photos I took in the car and interviews I conducted later, explored what modernity might mean for Lebanon, specifically through a typographic and linguistic lens. But before I really dive in, I want to give you a little background on how the project came to be. Two years ago, as an undergrad, I came here to typographics and kind of had my mind blown by one specific speaker, Lara Kaptan, who is a Lebanese type designer based in Amsterdam. I actually recently went back in my phone and found this screenshot of a story I posted after the talk. Um, I was super excited. And I think this is a prime example of why representation matters. It was the first time I had ever seen a Lebanese person and a woman, too, up on stage in a setting like this. So back in 2017, Lara spoke about the Arabic type design program that she and Christian Sarkis started at the American University of Beirut and how their goal is to bridge the gap between the Arabic script and Arabic digital type. Their work focuses on studying the history of the script in order to generate fundamentals for designing typefaces. So that talk was really kind of crazy for me because I've always been fascinated by the Arabic language and at the time was a budding typography nerd, but I also had never seen those two interests coming and occupy, occupying the same space. So I went from not even knowing there was an Arabic type design scene to discovering that we're literally in the middle of a sort of Arabic type design revolution, thanks to recent advancements in type design technology that I'll get into later. And of course, all these amazing pioneers in the field, and I'm sure the list goes on, but these are some of my favorites. Uh, so first, I want to explain the four characteristics that contribute to Arabic's complexity and make it unfit for Latin-based technology. And just a disclaimer, I'm by no means an expert on this subject. I'm not even a type designer, and I'm still learning the nuances to a lot of this stuff. I'm sure this list could go on, but I've cut it down to four simple things. The first one is that we read Arabic from right to left. Second, it's a connected script, so unlike Latin, the letters form words by joining together. Third, Arabic letters are kind of like shapeshifters. Their physical form changes depending on where they appear in a word and what letters they appear next to. So all four of these forms up on the screen are actually the same letter, which is kind of crazy. And finally, my favorite characteristic is that Arabic is stretchy. There's a technique called kashida that's used by calligraphers and now typographers to extend certain letters for justification purposes. There are a handful of letters that you can do this with. For example, if you have the word rahim or merciful and you want it to take up as much space as the Latin word, you can do this. You can even do this and you could keep going forever basically and it would still read the same way. Uh, and we see this technique being used throughout history. So here it's being used in an early 14th century Quran manuscript, and we see it in Lebanon today, and I'm sure in other contemporary settings as well. Here on a road sign to make the Arabic text as long as the French, and here in my favorite airport sign uh, with the same purpose. And so something we hear time and time again is that the written word in the Middle East was and still is the primary form of expression rather than images like in the West. 
And the reason for this is that Islam prohibits the making of images of living beings. So for example, during the Renaissance, when the West was focused on the human body, artists in the Middle East were concentrated on abstract forms of expression, like ornamentation, geometric pattern, and of course, calligraphy. Here's a prayer niche from 14th century Iran. There are no images whatsoever, but it's decorated beautifully with geometric patterns and Arabic inscriptions of passages from the Quran. This is the insignia of Suleiman the Magnificent from 16th century Turkey. Uh, these royal seals were often created by specialized scribes in a way that nobody could read, but more importantly, uh, nobody could forge. So we have all this beautiful calligraphic history spanning centuries in the Middle East, into the 50s and the 70s, and now suddenly in contemporary times we have things like this. which have no historical precedent whatsoever. They're purely reflections of the limitations of the technology. I'm a little afraid to bring up sans serifs after yesterday, uh, <laughs> but they're a good example of an innovation in type design that does have a historical precedent. The difference is that they were born out of expression rather than constraints. So the sans followed the serif, which followed calligraphy, uh, and Arabic type is missing that progression. So this phenomenon was sort of the seed that grew into my thesis. Uh, I was interested in the idea of modern Arabic and how it appears in the world today. So I was asking all these questions like, why does Arabic type look the way it does today? And what defines our contemporary vernaculars and where do they come from? Why does the vast majority of contemporary Arabic type look so different from the beautiful calligraphy we saw before? So through my research, I found that the origins of this rupture in the evolution of the Arabic script uh, was the invention of the metal movable type printing press in 15th century Europe, which obviously was created for Latin. The first use of Arabic movable type was to promote Christian conversion in the Middle East. So here we see two pages from the first printed book using Arabic movable type, the Book of Hours. And here Arabic was adjusted to be compatible with the discrete letter structure of the press. And this led to the creation of simplified Arabic, which is quite tragic, as Lara Keptan would say, because it abandons key characteristics like certain ligatures and variable baselines that make the Arabic script what it is. But in 2009, Thomas Milo's team at DecoType created the Advanced Composition Engine, which finally brought our type technology up to speed with the full requirements of the script. It's really complicated and I don't fully understand it at all, but uh, basically it breaks the script down into elemental building blocks rather than treating the letters as discrete forms. And so here's the problem that we have. Arabic type designers have spent around 150 years from 1860 to 2009 designing Arabic type with Latin constraints. But what happens now that the technology has caught up to the demands of the Arabic script? Before we had this technology, it made sense that so much of the Arabic we were seeing was Latinized. There was also a big demand for it. One example that was immediately obvious to me as I was looking around in Lebanon uh, was the luxury storefronts. When brands want to expand their, their business to the Middle East, because there's a lot of money there, they need to Arabize their logos. So we see things like this, where the Arabic is created uh, after the Latin to match it in a very literal way. And this isn't inherently wrong, but it's not really beneficial to the advancement of Arabic type either. Like James Edmondson said yesterday, we can strive for so much more than looking legit. Capitalist demands can't be the only driving force for what we create. So instead of looking like Latin characters, another path is to try to replicate calligraphy and digital type. This has value because it allows us to study basic principles of the script, like contrast and letter shaping. And it follows the same logic as learning Latin-based type design. The first project anyone does is usually a revival. And this step is necessary, but not sufficient. So for Arabic type to reach its full potential, we have to use the technology, not to replicate the past, but to reshape the future, 
to solve new problems and ask new questions. It's completely unclear what that will look like, but I think that's the most exciting part. And that's what modernism is at its core, another dangerous word from yesterday, uh, or at least what it was before it was reduced to a stylistic tool set, think grotesque, grid, left aligned. It was a belief in the power of the present and a constant redefining of the norm, a conversation with tradition that was ongoing. I think Phil Baines was pretty spot on when he said this in 1992. I see tradition as a living thing, an ongoing understanding of practicalities and conventions, which each age must interpret as necessary according to its own needs, learn and benefit from, and then pass on. It is not a static set of rules to be slavishly obeyed. So back to Lebanon, I want everyone to close their eyes for a minute and picture Beirut. Please don't fall asleep. What do you see? Do you see restaurants, malls, nightclubs, beaches, and mountains? Or do you see roadside merchants, refugees, traffic jams, cargo trucks, and bullet-ridden buildings? Okay, now open your eyes. This is Beirut. This is Beirut, too. This, too. And this is Beirut today. Lebanon is a complex country that has been transformed by war. No collection of photos could possibly capture its multitudes, its cosmopolitan beauty, and its scars of war. The Lebanese Civil War lasted 15 years and was a major turning point in the country's history. During the war, Beirut was split into halves. West Beirut was predominantly Muslim and East Beirut was predominantly Christian. And historically, the French had established ties with local Christians, creating a legacy of French education and culture in much of Christian Lebanon. So for that reason, when Beirut was split, the Muslim West side preferred Arabic and the Christian East preferred French. But when the war finally ended, people wanted to come together again, and one key way in which this manifested was through language. In storefronts and in everyday social interactions, Using multiple languages proved that you were modern and accepting. This practice still survives today, and you can see it pretty much everywhere throughout the country. So back to my project. Uh, when I went back to Lebanon two years ago, I noticed this phenomenon. I couldn't take my eyes off the roadside signage. Add to it the fact that I'm fluent in English, nearly fluent in French, and somewhat competent in Arabic, if we're being like super generous. Um, and I'm sure you can understand why I was staring out the car window in awe. So my design education here in the US trained me to appreciate function, grid systems, objectivity. Uh, but I still found beauty and paradoxical order in Lebanon's vernacular signs. <clears throat> which were largely, by my standards, quote unquote, ugly. Yesterday, Jerome said something that reflects the inner conflict I was having at the time. He said, ask yourself if modernism is your standard for what constitutes good design. So I first set out with my camera to take pictures of these signs, and when my sister saw what I was doing, she asked, are you going to make Lebanon look bad? And because my answer was, of course, no, my initial goal became to, became to challenge a Western audience to rethink what they consider modern. I returned from the trip with over a thousand photos, all taken en route from the back of my grandpa's car. The subjects were all typographic, from the calligraphy painted on the backs of cargo trucks to the shiny luxury type in storefronts. The graphics on the trucks, though, were the most intriguing to me because they felt like the truest expression of the native calligraphic forms of the Arabic script. In Lebanon, farmers and truck drivers decorate their vehicles as a form of spiritual protection against the risks that come with being on the road all the time. They often write out blessings or prayers. For instance, here it says, my Lord protect her, her being the bus. Uh, sometimes the drivers use symbols like the evil eye to protect themselves from harm caused by other people's envy of their truck's beauty. <laughs> this bus wards off the evil eye quite literally saying, take your eyes off of me. <laughs> this one says, shame on the eye, keep calm. This one, God bless, 
Drivers often consider their trucks to be either their alter egos or their lovers because it's the one thing they spend the most time with all day, every day. It's their primary companion. And so the bottom of this truck reads bride. It's pretty weird. This one says Alan's darling. Alan is probably the driver. This one predictably also says God bless. And it has a sort of proverb written on it too. It says, he who has confidence in his step walks like a king. Uh, this one's my favorite. It just says, I am the genius. <laughs> and it's just like shittily spray painted on there. Didn't even try. Uh, this one's pretty blunt. It says, I seek the satisfaction of God and my parents. So I wanted to wrap up today by showing the poster I made for the senior exhibition, which I created by taking all the vernacular type and logos from my photos and digitizing them. I was struggling to think of one singular image or message that could capture contemporary Lebanon, so I decided to include them all. And here it is. The Lebanese architect and archivist George Arbid said, when you speak of heritage in this part of the world, you straight away start thinking about ancient things. For us, it's a politically wrong position because it would mean that modernism is the other and tradition is us. The question of what modernity means for Lebanon is tricky. Everyone has a different answer and those answers often lead to more questions, but I know that there are ones worth asking. We need to radically reimagine how we conceive of ourselves outside of established Western conventions whether in describing our identity or designing our language. It's not about how we're seen, but about how we see ourselves. Thank you.